So here we are in July 2024. It's the second R&D tax credit claim case has gone before a tribunal being published anyway. Um, I did a previous video on a company called Get On Board Limited. That's really important if you're a software company in the UK or a tech startup. That previous case that I referred to called Get On Board Limited was decided in favour of the taxpayer. So HMRC lost that case. This one, not so much. Uh, this uh, this particular case, Tills Plus Limited, is also a software company. There's two kind of key points that are discussed here, and it actually fails on the main point about whether there's actually R&D involved. So I'll quickly run through this case. Not, I don't think it's as important as the Get On Board case, as I said in my previous video, but still useful and nonetheless for certain points. So again, already tax credits. Um, and I'm going to sort of whiz through this. Two key points it turns on. First of all, about payment, whether payment was actually made to a subcontractor. And the second part to this is whether there was actually R&D activities in the first place. Uh, this first point uh, gives, let's get to sort of a bit of background, the facts, etc. If we scroll down, okay. So um, in terms of the evidence, so two stages. The first relates to the payment issue. Um, Mr. Kazari here is the founder, the sole main shareholder of uh, Tills Plus Limited. And so as far as we are concerned, his evidence was straightforward and consistent with documentary evidence. And to give you a heads up, he is successful on the payment issue. Um, so Mr. Kazari readily accepted that he's not an expert in IT or artificial intelligence, but is more of a businessman. This, of course, has some impact on the extent to which we can rely on his evidence in relation to some of his more technical aspects of the definition of what constitutes R&D. So the second part of this is all about whether they're actually uh, carrying out R&D. And this comes back to that point about the need for a competent professional in the company as well to explain very clearly and articulate why and how the work undertaken is qualifying R&D for tax purposes. Um, in addition to answering the questions put to him, Mr. Kazari replied, relied heavily on a report prepared for the company by Dr. Zaid in 2021. When taken to earlier explanations given to HMRC as to what the R&D consisted of, his attempts to explain the apparent inconsistency between these documents was, in our view, unconvincing in the light of the other documentary evidence. So that gives you another heads up that he actually fails on the qualifying R&D aspect. And that really comes down to well, two factors. The competent professional test, he wasn't a competent professional in the sector, and he gave a lot of the initial evidence. Um, and secondly, uh, the requirement for... Um, there to be documentary evidence throughout that kind of supports the importance of having a consistent story that sets out how and why the work undertaken is qualifying R&D. This Dr. Zaid is a competent professional, uh, but he comes along later, gives evidence, or there's kind of there's a kind of a mismatch in timings of information. And what he describes differs quite largely from what Mr. Gazari explained the work to be. And as we'll see in a moment, a lot of the explanations that Dr. Uh, Mr. Gazari, the, the businessman, the founder of the business, the entrepreneur, gives are very feature and benefit driven, which is typical of a businessman, not actual referring to the underlying technology. So it weakens the case horribly, and that's why it ultimately falls over. So... So, you know, the fact back to the facts, Tills Plus develops the technology for the hospitality industry and is involved in a particular, in particular, in electronic uh, point of sale EPOS systems. So, uh, hospitality industry, and what actually happens is the first part we could refer to as a payment situation. And long story short, there's a share, there's a loan involved. So, basically, the, the invoices through the subcontract to a third party called I1s, and the Payments are settled by a third party who makes payments um, on behalf of the company, so creating a loan. And HMRC is saying well, the payments aren't actually made by the company directly, and therefore it's not a qualifying payment. And under subcontractor rules, you've got to have made payment for it to qualify. So it says the undisputed facts are I1's invoices were addressed to Tills Plus and were therefore on obligation of Tills Plus. So the claimant company was on the hook for the uh, invoices. The invoices was physically paid by Mr. I'm not pronouncing his name, but this was treated by agreement as a loan from him to Mr. Kazari <laughs> and a loan by Mr. Kazari to Tills Plus. So it's kind of like um, there are points of separation between the payments and um, the company. However, they were, these payments were made on behalf of the company because the company had the invoices and it's kind of they do ultimately connect. HMRC were trying to stop that. Um, and they, say, they basically say stuff like... Um, it wasn't a commercial loan, it carried no interest, and there's no fixed date of repayment. And the judge says, however, we cannot see that the commerciality or otherwise the loan can make any difference to the question as to whether that payment's been made by Tills Plus to I1. So they basically dismiss it at this point and say, you know, they take more of a purposive approach to the legislation, which I think is right in this case, because if you were to take HMRC's argument, it'd be far too narrow 
and um, would I think would be detrimental to the interpretation of RD tax relief. So right decision here. Uh, then we move on to the second point, which is about the um, qualifying nature of the work, and it says it's a common ground the burden of proof is on TILS Plus to show that the relevant requirements have been satisfied. Taking the guidelines into account, this means that TILS Plus, the claimant company, needs to show that the work which the subcontractor was asked to do amounted to a project which sought to achieve and advance the science and technology through the resolution of technological uncertainty. The views of a competent professional are highly relevant as the resolution of an uncertainty is not a technological advance if it could be readily deduced or solved by a competent professional. We all know this is kind of um, well-trodden ground, but it's really, again, once again, pounding home the fact that you've got to have a competent professional involved in the process throughout an R&D claim. They've got to be involved in the drafting of the claim, the report from beginning to end. Otherwise, it starts to unravel, as you will see in this case here. Uh, in relation to who qualifies as a competent professional, um, they refer to the decision of the first year tribunal. It's a very recent decision, Flame Tree Publishing, again, another 2024 case. Uh, the tribunal in that case accepted HMRC's, HMRC's submission that a competent professional is someone who is able to demonstrate appropriate qualifications, experience, and up to date knowledge of the relevant scientific and technological principles involved. And they accept this as a, a convenient description. Interestingly, the Get On Board case, which is the previous video I've done, uh, HMRC in that case, not HMRC, sorry, the judge, the tribunal was prepared to accept relevant experience and up-to-date knowledge as being enough. In that case, the relevant competent professional didn't have relevant qualifications, but they had a boatload of experience, 25 years of experience, and HMRC, sorry, the judge was prepared to accept that as sufficient in that case. A slight different difference in interpretation there. During the course of HMRC's inquiry, the company made a number of attempts at explaining what it was that they were trying to do in the work that had been subcontracted to I want. And this is kind of, as I say, this is where it unravels because it goes through different ways. You know, the first description is really high level. In summary, we set out uh, to research and develop the first complete modular ecosystem to increase the control of the merchant and the business, increase business productivity, reduce staff costs. Far too generic. You know, you need to go f layers deeper in terms of what you're looking to achieve, what the baseline state of technology was. Um, what what were you trying to achieve? Why couldn't you achieve it with existing technologies? What was the, the technical knowledge gap that existed? All those sorts of things. This is just way too generic, this stuff here. Um, then it goes on to say, um, uh, yeah, various documents come about, and then a further email from uh, the founder to HMRC explains the aim of the company as an amazing feature-packed EPOS platform with a complete ecosystem of solutions so that the merchant will no longer need to integrate with other third-party platforms and then list the various solutions that are, will be available. Again, classic entrepreneurial business man, features-led, benefits-led. Don't want that for R&D claims. You want what's under the hood. HMRC couldn't care less about the features and benefits. I mean, if you can show you added functionality stuff, great, but it's not the point, it's more about the underlying process of what you've achieved to advance the underlying technology that's absolutely key and it kind of way misses the mark. So we go through back and forth about where various documents were submitted and we kind of cut to chase here, but it said, when asked to explain the inconsistency between the explanations provided uh, by, basically by the founder, he emphasized the fact that he was not an IT AI expert and he was not, and he was approaching the issue from the point of view of a businessman so that inevitably he couldn't go into the level of technological detail contained in the later December 2020 report, which was done by the competent professional. So we've got discrepancies, it's unraveling here. Don't let the founders get involved or use a founder in writing the report unless you are a tech person, a competent professional on the set to yourself. Uh, this is the lesson here. Um, scrolling through, back and forth, back and forth, going through. And here we get to it. So, not suggesting the activities explained to it, blah, 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 blah. We have no doubt that he was right to do so. As the um, founder accepted in his evidence, the creation of the virtual operational manager simply involved taking existing technology or products and combining them to provide an integrated system. There is no evidence this would achieve an advance in science or technology by resolving uh, scientific technological uncertainties. Such an integrated platform might be novel, but... Under the first case that ever became for the courts, Studios Limited, Smith & Williamson, uh, the fact that something's new and involves technology does not mean, men, mean that it qualifies as R&D. That's what that case established. It is possible that the integration of the various modules to create the virtual operational manager could constitute an appreciable improvement of existing products or processes. However, without further evidence, we cannot say that what was being done would be acknowledged by a competent professional 
working in a field is a genuine and non-trivial improvement. And this is what differs from the previous case to get on board, in which in that case, the competent professional could explain how they would linked and knitted together different components of existing technology by adding new code on top to create the advance. We're, na we're unable to explain it here, and that's why it's kind of all falling down. Um, in a similar vein, um, work on combining standard technologies or processes can involve scientific or technological uncertainty, even if the principles for their integration are well known. This would be the case where a competent professional cannot readily deduce how the separate components or subsystems would be should be combined to have the intended function. Again, very important links back to that get on board previous case that I mentioned. Well worth looking and watch that video. Um, so. They submit, we have no evidence from a competent professional as to whether there would in fact have been any uncertainties in combining the various modules to create the virtual operational manager. Again, I'm having that point. Competent professional throughout the process here is necessary. Um, and that's really the case. So it, unfortunately it falls over on that. So HMRC do not accept that there's qualifying R&D. So the payment bar becomes kind of irrelevant, although it's useful for future reference when you've got kind of indirect loans um, and this purposive approach that was adopted is kind of useful to provide us some sort of support for that. So that kind of covers this um, case and it just shows again how the importance of getting the facts right, um, setting out the facts as get on board judgment referred to, getting your scientific technological cards face side up into a nice document that highlights all of your scientific and technological uh, ass um, assertions as to why it was not readily deducible by a competent professional and the resulting advance that comes out of it. My name is Steve Livingston and thanks for watching.